I'd like to pull the whole vitamin D story together. So first of all, vitamin D and autoimmune disease. If it doesn't do any harm, surely it's worth trying. We know that other agents that are very similar to vitamin D are used to treat things like arthritis, steroids, glucocorticoids, prednisolone, prednisone, dexamethasone. These are all used with some success in treating uh, the inflammation associated with autoimmune disease. Now, the problem with glucocorticoids, of course, they have very bad side effects. They affect your bones. They give you osteoporosis. And vitamin D just acts in a very similar fashion, and it doesn't really have that downside when it comes to your bone function. So I think one idea is that, you know, potentially using vitamin D in conjunction with uh, glucocorticoids would be quite a positive way of, of looking at the treatment of autoimmune disease, certainly something like arthritis, um, a combination, for example. They both work together really well at in increasing your levels of these regulatory T cells, these Tregs. So yeah, I think this is, these, are, these are areas of potential vitamin D function that we're trying to explore here at Birmingham new ways of potentially utilizing vitamin D, potentially in combination with other treatments, as a, a treatment rather than a preventative agent for autoimmune disease. Mm, mm, that's interesting. Now, could you summarize the current position? So firstly, what do we understand about the role of vitamin D? We know one of the key things we, we know is that many communities around the, the globe, not just in the UK, are at risk of vitamin D deficiency or maybe vitamin D deficient. So the question is, well, what does that mean in terms of their health? Well, of course, it means they're potentially at risk of um, rickets bone disease if you're a child, for example. But I think it goes beyond that now. We've seen there's a strong link between vitamin D, low vitamin D levels, and a wide range of human health issues. Now, the argument would be that possibly this is, is a consequence of the disease and not because of the, the vitamin D deficiency. But I think given that vitamin D is a relatively cheap and relatively safe agent, then there is, there is at least a good rationale behind uh, improving the vitamin D levels for individuals. I think we'll see over the next few years more studies like the Mendelian randomization studies I mentioned before that hint at a causal link between vitamin D deficiency and some disorders. Um, that's important. I think people have to be confident that, you know, uh, if I take vitamin D supplement, I'm going to have some sort of improvement. And I think the message will be that this probably has little benefit for those who already have plenty of vitamin D, but it has potentially important benefits for people who are vitamin D deficient. And I think that would include quite a lot of people in the UK. So I think we're going to see more evidence that vitamin D could be important. We're going to see perhaps more negative randomized control trials because I think they are very difficult to execute. They're often flawed design and so on. So there will be a mixture of things. You have to bear that in mind. The vitamin D field is a, is a roller coaster research field. It can be up one week and down the next week. But I think we're beginning to move towards one, I think, good consensus, which is that in countries like the UK where vitamin D deficiency is prevalent, that we have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, what are the implications for practitioners, prescribers and patients? We do have to look quite closely at a, another step up. I think you mentioned this earlier on, but food fortification would be, I think, perhaps the easiest way forward. It would mean rather than having to target individuals, the whole population would gain some benefit. But that would still not uh, negate the idea that we have to look at at-risk groups in the UK, and I think this is where practitioners need to come in and say, you know, if you have uh, communities where the dark skin pigmentation is common, they will be at risk of vitamin D deficiency. Pregnant women who may be indoors more will, are also an at-risk group, the elderly, housebound people, and so on. I think this is a, the onus is really on practitioners to sort of be able to recognize this. You don't necessarily have to have massive screening exercise of vitamin D analysis. You can pretty much predict that certain people will be at risk. And these people, they may need more than just the fortification, they may need targeted supplementation to improve um, their vitamin D health. And I think if we can do that, it will certainly, hopefully 100 years after vitamin D was discovered, finally cure rickets in the UK, because we still have that this year, even though vitamin D was discovered 100 years ago, finally cure rickets. And, you know, 
there may be some additional health benefits, common cancers, autoimmune disease. And if we could improve that a little bit, then that's that's got to be worth doing. I think it's it's not an expensive treatment or prevention op option. So why not go for it? Professor Martin Hewison, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and your insights with us today. That really has been terrifically interesting. For more information about Professor Hewison's work, please visit our website using the link in the description and be sure to sign up for more videos, news and journals. For updates straight to your inbox, please follow the link below. And thanks for watching.